the most precise union break I've ever heard of. Okay. Huh? Yeah, it used to be exactly an hour, and now it's like an hour and six minutes. Okay. So, let's, uh, let's get back to less, slightly less freaky stuff. Uh, let's see how far do I want to make it tonight. Yeah. The nice thing about the next two sections is I've sort of already talked about them. So I just want to make sure that we, we don't leave anything out. So continuity I've talked about a little bit already. Yeah. So are you going to do a square function for the... Always a bonus problem. I might do something. It might even be squared. It might be something else as a bonus problem. And it says, so I always give three bonus problems at the end of any test. And... As many of you know, it's kind of like, that's nice, but I never get there, Jeff. But, but uh, <laughs> It's just there in case you completely don't know how to do a problem. You can just try those out and see if you can get some points. Um, so, yeah, I'll probably have a bonus problem that's a little more interesting function for a epsilon delta proof. Um, but can somebody tell me, what's the main idea of continuity? I've talked about it already earlier tonight, but what's the requirements or continuity. Well, it limits exist in every place. Let's do it like this. Let's do it. Continuity, that's a good point. At a point. And this is assuming a lot. So let me just say at x equal to a. For a function to be continuous at some value, what must be true? Be a little more specific. How do you mean both sides? The and the one, the one what? The top one. Right. Keyword limit. limit. All right. So the limit from one direction must be the same as the limit from the other direction, and it must be some finite value. So to be a lot more precise, I mean, that's the idea behind it, but all I really need to say is to be continuous at some point x equal a, the limit as x goes to a of the function, and actually this is not even enough, this is for the limit to exist. <laughs> what makes the continuity true? It has to be defined at that point. And in fact, even more specifically, f of a must be that limit. So to put all that crap into one tiny statement, I can say the limit as x goes to a of f of x must equal f of a. That's what must be true for a function to be continuous at some input a. This holds in it this and this equivalent, right? If the limit exists and it's not some infinite thing, then that means the limit exists from both sides and they agree. Are you guys with me so far? And of course this says the function exists and it's equal to that limit. So this is a really nice, concise way of saying what's required for continuity. So that's the whole thing I was talking about last time about the evil dead and the bridge was out. Put the bridge back up please so I can get away from the freaky thing. Okay. I'm trying to eat my soul. <laughs> i got to watch that movie, you know. All right. They're coming out with Evil Dead 3, you know what? Um, maybe. Uh, so, continuity, yeah, it would be 4, that's right. Army Dark Darkness. Yeah. They're coming out the next one. Um, so, for example, they're going to give you problems that are going to look a lot like the problems from the limit sections. Uh, they're gonna have, in fact, they're going to look almost exactly the same. So if you look at the homework, number four, page 127. I'm going to turn all the stuff off. Dad gummit. you got to be really careful. It's so easy to forget, am I talking about the limit existing or am I talking about continuity? Which one is more difficult to attain? Continuity, because the limit can exist and there could be a big old freaking open circle in the middle. That's fine for limits. Continuity needs that bridge. 
It has to be able to go through evenly. Just keep going. Oh. So look at number four in the homework. Whoa, Jeff. Think the intervals on which G is continuous. So, of course, the way to look at a problem like that is where could it be discontinuous? And actually, we're going to be a lot more precise about what kind of continuity it might have, or discontinuity. <coughs> Questions? All right. There's going to be a lot of turning around for this thing. How much battery do I have? Um, so where's the first thing I see that's discontinuous? Negative two. Yeah, negative two. We're going to talk a little bit about, see, what's on this side here? Nothing. Nothing. So can the limit exist here? No. Just purely. Because the limit requires from both sides, right? But to be fair, it's not this guy's fault that the domain doesn't include anything there. So we say it's continuous from one direction. We say this is continuous from the right, from above. Does that make sense? Specifically because the function exists there, it agrees with the limit, and I just completely ignore the fact that there's nothing there. It's not its fault. You guys kind of understand that? So just because I have an endpoint and there's no domain over there, it should still have a right to be fine. It's just nothing's over there. It's a blank void. Uh, of course, here, what, what I, I have major problems. The function exists. The limit from below, the limit from above, okay. They exist, but of course, the limit, does the limit at negative 2 exist? No. no. So it dies here. It doesn't even get past, past this point. It's okay here. The function exists, but it doesn't equal this because this doesn't even agree with itself. This is what's called a jump. you got to love that name because it's exactly what the hell it does. Jump discontinuity. I don't have to explain that because it jumps. So it jumps again. From here to here, it jumps again here. So they don't have the other kind. Stupid problem. And of course, here, this is just asymptotic, so it's an infinite uh, discontinuity. Uh, I can't remember what the book calls it. The one that's not there, the one that's most interesting. Oh, what about that eight? So is it continuous in any way? No. Cool. So it's not continuous from below because the function does not exist there. So continuity always needs that function to actually exist there. So that would apply from negative two to two as well. So we're not so nice. You can say that this is continuous from above, but you normally wouldn't because it's in the middle of its domain. It's not at the endpoints of its domain. You could say that, but that would be wrong. This is continuous from above, but that's a little tricky because this limit does the limit exist at two? No. no. Well, for a step function, for example, we kind of give it a little leeway to be uh, continuous at its endpoints, even though it's got a jump discontinuity. So personally, I would say just the endpoints, the very endpoints, should be given leeway. This, this guy here is simply discontinuous. I wouldn't say it's continuous from one side or the other. So which intervals would be continuous? Because I love it. Negative 4 to negative 2, like there's a hole at the end. Of the so which... So it looks like from negative 4 to negative 2, and of course at negative 2 I have to put parentheses because they don't want to include it. And then it picks up again from negative 2 up to 2. Because everywhere in between here, of course, there's no problem. Here, the limit agrees and the function is there. So do you guys with me? But they're, not so, doing, they're not giving you like an actual point there. But they don't need to. Um, they're just really overstating these. Right? Bless you. They could put a bunch of big ass dots there, but then it'd just be a really chunky line. So I understand that the points are all there because it's connected. Um, where's the pick? And then it picks up again at two. And I would argue it'd be this. I think the book would actually argue the other way, but agree to disagree. From two to four. What about four? Do I include it? No. Hell no. And then four up to. Six? Do I include six? No. Hell no. And then six up to eight. Don't include either of those. 
So if 8 would have been filled in, I would have included it because I give leeway for the endpoints. Yes, sir. Why didn't you include the 2 to 4? The 2 to 4? Oh, there's 2 to 4? Oh, i got to look through. The leeway we give, what's the limit at 2? Undefined. Undefined. So can it ever agree with this requirement? No. 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 We only give, and I think the book agrees with me, but I can't remember now. We only give that leeway at the endpoints because there's no way the limit could exist here, period, because there's nothing here to compare it to. If there was something here, maybe it does match up, but there's nothing there. So it's a little unfair to require the limit to exist from both sides because nothing exists over there. You guys got it with me? Now in here, I don't have to look only here because something does exist on that side. I can see the limit does not exist, so it has no chance at that point to be continuous. Because the limit doesn't exist, so it can't even match this part of it. So those are just the areas of continuity? Or? Those are where it's continuous. I love it. By not allowing, doing this not allows those discontinuous points. Okay. I like it. So that's how you, you answer the question where it's continuous, by removing where it's discontinuous. So if 8 was uh, blooded in? Then I would have made this. Okay. Yep, just like this one. Cool. Okay. Okay, and oh, the last, let me see. How come the second or the third one, how come that's not bracket? Right the two four is not a bracket. Where are we at, sir? Two four, how come that's not a bracket? Because it's a close to the point. The two? Yeah. Oh, because, again, um, what's the limit as x goes to 2? What's the limit as x goes to 2? Yeah, doesn't agree. So it can never match this. We give only the endpoints leeway because they automatically can't match this because there's nothing that exists outside of them. So that makes sense to me that we give them leeway. Yes. So really there should be no brackets in between, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, there'd almost be no point because if there's a bracket here, they'd have to be a bracket there, and then why even write it like that? Yeah, good. All right. Oh, so there's infinite discontinuities. Which again, requires no real um, explanation. It's just where it goes to infinity, right? And the last type that's not in that problem is one of my favorites in, you know, hopefully match which you would have a favorite discontinuity. And they really don't have a good example of it. It's going to drive me crazy. Um, here, perfect. Okay. Number three. Freeze. It's called a removable discontinuity. Can anybody tell what that would be? I love it. It's removable because if I just defined f of negative 4 to be this, I would remove it. I would put the bridge back in. Right? You guys with me? So I love that idea of the removable discontinuity. I can fix that discontinuity just by defining a single point. But I cannot fix this discontinuity. There's no way. It's already defined. There's no way to force these two together, right? Well, that's to become God's God again. I don't know. It's probably the secret to space travel right there. Exactly. Something like that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, now comes all the theorems. So we have this idea. We already went over the continuous from the right. Continues from the left. Uh, continuous on an interval. It's continuous. Uh, and so we already saw that example just now. That's how we created those intervals. Um, if I have two continuous functions and I make these kind of combinations out of them, the result is continuous. Does that kind of make sense? The most basic idea of a continuous function would be polynomials. They're defined so that they exist everywhere and they have no problems. So if I add them, subtract them, 
scalar mode, blah, 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 than the result is. And that kind of leads to this interesting thing here. Well, polynomials are nice. I mean, there's, there's, there's no getting away from it. Rational functions. Now, you might think rational functions have major problems, but of course, we just want to say, where is it continuous? It's continuous everywhere on its domain. So if it's 1 over x minus 2, it's continuous everywhere except 2. Right? You just throw that one part out. That's the infinite discontinuity. Throw it out. It's fine everywhere else. And so here are all the things, all the functions that are continuous on their domain. So all those functions are continuous on their domain. That might help you somewhere out in the homework. Okay. Whatever the domain is, all of these are continuous on the domain. Exponential, of course, we know are nice. Okay. Inverse trig functions might be a little weird there, but that, no, they're not that bad. Okay. Oh, blah, blah. Yeah, now this is a kind of an important one. There's always that question of, um, this is a big step to take. We've already defined where I can do this. Um, and in very specific situations, uh, for example, if I have a limit as x goes to 2, uh, the cube root of, of um, x plus 6, what's that? Yeah, because you just brought that inside. So this is the limit as x goes to 2 of f of g of x, where f is the cube root and g of x is x plus 6. You guys kind of with me? Yeah. So I can skip over and go right inside and do that, but this is being a lot more specific about that. You can only do that if the functions you're dealing with, f has got to be continuous at b, and the limit, is not, that's why it's got to continue to be. Then that's the only time this works. Now, to not be true, it's got to be some really contrived mess, but that's basically, that's the idea. It's, that's what's got to be true. And of course, cube root, it's beautiful. The root function, they're, they're continuous on their domains. What are we doing so far? Okay, okay. I just want to leave anything out here. Blah, blah, blah. Except for that. Um, okay. So this continuity section shouldn't be too evil. The further you get to the homework, though, the, the slightly more conceptual the questions become. So if your only problems are with the later homework problems, you're doing pretty well. Don't leave them blank. Ask a question, but still. Um, and then the infinite limits we <coughs> talked about already. Limits at infinity, horizontal asymptotes. We've been talking about that every day we've met, it feels like. Right? The, the things you learn in pre-calc, the three situations, how that ties into limits at infinity. There you go. So that's a perfect example. The degree is the same, top and bottom. So, of course, the limit as x goes to infinity is going to be 1. Right? Okay? Not too bad. Okay, and I'm not going to get into, let me see where they have this. Oh, I, I've done enough epsilon delta kind of stuff to you guys. I'm too forced, so we're not gonna, I'm not going to really worry too much about this definition. You can look at it if you want to. It's kind of an extension of the epsilon delta into infinite limits. Hmm. Okay, so the kind of problems you're going to see here are going to have uh, just straight up limit questions for the infinities. So, for example, just to make sure everybody can understand what's going on here, what's 3b? So, what's it say? As what happens? The limit as x approaches negative infinity. So my inputs are approaching negative infinity. My inputs are approaching negative infinity. What are my outputs doing? Going to 2. Yeah, it looks like they're going to 2. So you could argue, I don't know what it does after, but you have to, and I, I agree with you in a way, you have to kind of set, go along with what it looks like the book is trying to, the pattern is setting up. So the book is trying to set the pattern up. It's getting really close to 2. This is nowhere near infinity, but that's the point you're trying to make. Probably turns into an isolate and an oscillation right off of the page too. 
Probably. You never know. <laughs> so it's really evil. Um, so the two kinds of infinite limits, the limit where the actual inputs go to infinity and the limits where the outputs go to infinity, those are the kind of things you're going to see here. So that's kind of nice, actually. It's limits, but very specific limits. Infinities are involved. Um, and then here's the weird part. Let's look at one of these. Unfreeze. Look at the instructions. <coughs> Freeze. Um, and we've talked about this the other day already, but let's see who remembers. Look at number 15. First one. Should be the easiest problem in there. What do you have to look at to really answer that question? Oh, the leading coefficient. The ratio though. Yeah, good. So this is the easiest one of the easier problems in there, right? As x goes to infinity, this is gonna be what? Three halves. I love it. It's the same degree. Three halves. Now look at Oh, let me see, where's a good example? Well, I don't have the one I'm expecting. Oh, let's see, maybe there. Oh, okay. This one looks really evil. Let's see if I can get it there. 33? Let's see, you guys should be able to handle that. Oh, there it is. Okay, perfect. So this was not nearly as hard as it sounds, hopefully. We should know what arctangent looks like. Not cotangent, right? What does arctangent look like? What's tangent look like? Do it in the air. Oh, like, uh, it looks like a cubic, right? What's arctangent look like? It sort of looks like a cube root, right? And what are the what are these around it? And what are those asymptotes? What are the values? No. So what's what the the tangent itself is contained where? Pi over 2. Yeah, negative pi over 2, pi over 2. So you just turn the whole thing around, so this must be pi over 2, negative pi over 2. So what's happening to e to the x? Now, our tangent is an inverse trig function. In order for me to put that limit inside, this function has got to be continuous, and it's in the list of continuous functions, you remember? Or I just told you. So I'm allowed to put that limit inside. What's e to the as x goes to infinity, what does e to that go to? Infinity. So as arctangent of this, as the argument goes to infinity, the arctangent goes to pi over 2. Right? That's the asymptote. That's the infinite asymptote for that. It'll do that. Now, here's the problem I was looking for. Number 30. Think about that one for a minute. Actually, it should take less than a minute. Spoke about this one earlier. We came at it from a purely uh, uh, um, classical mechanics way, and then we came at it from a very religious way, like a religious squared way. Then, this is easy. What happens when... Yeah, what happens when this goes to infinity? e to the negative x is 1 over e to the x. And when the bottom gets really big, 1 divided by that gets really small. This goes to 0. Is that cool? Yeah. Hell yeah, that goes to 0. But what happens to this dude? Yeah. What's the limit? Two. <laughs> What happens to cosine? Does it, does it get closer and closer to something? In order for a limit to exist, it's got to get closer and closer to something. The whole epsilon delta business, right? Does not exist. So the limit of this whole thing does not exist. Because a part of it does not exist. Yeah, what's zero plus does not exist? 
Does that exist? <laughs> you guys with me? That's the example, that's what I was looking for. A really good example of a function, uh, a limit that does not exist. What, what do you guys think you have to do with this one? What should your gut tell you you're going to have to do with that? Because limits x to infinity, this would be infinity minus infinity. That's, that's an indeterminate fourth. Which infinity is bigger? Depends on how you draw it. No. <laughs> you, you, what do you, what's your gut say you have to do with this? Multiply the contrary. Multiply the contrary. Top and bottom. And believe it or not, it becomes really easy after that. Uh, okay. All right. Let's see. Oh. I'll just... Okay. So I think well, one last thing I want to tell you, and then we'll head out. Uh, actually, one last thing I want to show you. Get there really quickly. Ooh. Don't worry, I'll switch it over here. So, so the main thing with chapter two, it started off with um, trying to figure out what the slope was at a point. And then why did we do all the limit stuff? Because, of course, you can't have a slope at a point. You have to have two points that have a slope. So now that we understand limits, or at least we see how they can be used, I get them in the limit that this point gets close, gets right to that point. The limit that the distance between these two points goes to zero, which means every step of the way there's two points. So section two seven is finally. We're not going to do two seven. I'm just going to do a little preview. So don't freak out. But section two seven is finally where we start doing real, believe it or not, calculus. We merge the idea of limits with the first problem was how do we find a freaking limit, a freaking slope right at a point? I want to figure out that so I can get the tangent line, not the freaking secant lines. I want a tangent line. Um, so, look at that. No, I'm joking. I just push that Example that, that uh, Wolfram Alpha I showed you. If you have uh, web assign, you got the ebook, you have access to these uh, embedded demonstrations. You just click on those little red links I just clicked on. Um, oh, I enjoyed the platform. So the whole idea here, here's the whole idea. And, and this is a decent, very simple little thing that I can't zoom in on. No. Um, here, every step of the way here, this is basically the early part of chapter two, is um, they give you a point. This is at one. I'm curious about that one. So my other point currently is at uh, 1.58, 1.25, blah, blah, blah. I find the slope of the secant line, and then I go further in. So we were doing all that. You're having a lot of fun doing that. I know it's really exciting. Uh, plugging the stuff in the calculator and then seeing the pattern. Right? That's, that's what the early part of chapter 2 is all about. Um, so just letting that sucker come in and then get right on top of it. Now, that's neat. I can actually do it. What's it say when I get there? Oh, am I right? I'm not quite right on top. <laughs> so it looks like the slope is approaching 0.5 right there. Right? So that's the idea. I, I, I can have a secant line. I can have two points the whole way. I just want to get so close that it looks like there's one point. And the only way to really do that algebraically is to use a limit. So where we finally are at, and you missed all that. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I need something that follows, I don't know, something. Um, where we finally are at is this. 
uh, the slope formula. What's the slope formula for algebra? Delta 1. Delta 1. All right, let's make one little adjustment and make it way much better. Okay, wow. That's the idea there, right? Um, so, let me define these points a little better. So, if I have a uh, function, and I want to know what the slope is right there, that's x. I have something else that's h away from that. So what's this here? <coughs> I like it. That's f of x. And what's this here? f of x plus h. So using the slope formula, the slope of the secant line there will be, this is the slope of the secant line. f of x plus h. Good. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And of course, what happens on the bottom there? And we saw this before, didn't we? Yeah. And we did a few problems, the H cancels and all that kind of crap. Now we're finally going to see why that's so important for that H to cancel. Because really, what's the idea now? How do I find the, the slope right at that point? What do I allow to happen? Make them stack by bringing them close together. And how do I make them get close together? What variable controls how close they are? H. H. So when will H go to zero? I like it. So the limit as h goes to 0 of this this is what's called the derivative this is given the symbol f prime that's one way to designate it that's that's the calculus name for the slope so what this does is it takes algebra and takes it one step further. Algebra, you can only handle straight lines. Slope is always five. That's exciting. Calculus says, screw that. I'll use the same damn thing you guys did. Get a little bit funkier, right? But now I can find the slope of any function at any point, given that I can actually do this, right? How are you feeling so far? Let's try one simple example, and then I'll let you guys out. I always got to push it, don't I? What's that? 14-minute example. Oh, no. No, it's not. Trust me. Oh, uh, real quick, before I get too far away from here, this is a uh, Newtonian uh, sim symbol. Right, this is in Newtonian notation. Uh, leave this notation. I'm going to try to do a little better job than I did last semester. Because uh, we get so focused on this, because we kind of use that a lot. But units and other types of functions, other types of processes, it's easier if I write it. So you have f prime. That's another name for the derivative. That's the symbol for derivative. Derivative is another name for slope. slope. Good. Rate of change. Slope. I like it. Um, Leibniz notation. This is Newton notation. Leibniz said, no, it's going to be. So this is actually a lot more uh, precise. This is the derivative of f with respect to x. So if I have many variables in a function, I want to say with respect to y, with respect to z, with respect to w, this prime is kind of like, hmm, what does it mean? <laughs> so it, it, if you have many variables, you obviously want to use the, this uh, notation. But it's also very simple to tell the units. And when we start doing higher derivatives, we'll see what it looks like here, and the units just come right out of this. The prime notation, you don't see units for shit. But if this was uh, uh, height in meters and time in seconds, then this is meters per second. Yeah, exactly. You can see the units. Here, this is f prime. This is nice. We use it a lot because it's very quick. This is also nice because you can actually see the units that you're going to have to give me units or you're going to lose points. Right. Okay, so, quick, let me write the word quick there to try to keep me honest. As if that could do it. Um, so, let's say I have x squared. 
Now, real quick, Jeff, if you put a lot of quick things together, it's going to be long. But can anybody tell me anything about this slope here? Just anything. So. Negative, I like it. And of course, the further back I go, the steep break gets, right? And the same thing, of course, over here, it's positive, and the further I go, the steeper it gets. And of course, here, the slope is zero. flat at zero. So what this here does is it allows me to get a function where if I plug in something, I can figure out what the slope is at that point. And it's actually, this is, so we've done this before. You did, I do this with my Math 90 students when I teach them functions. Believe it or not, because I'm evil. Huh? Well, definitely my 103. I don't know. Um, what's, what do I need to do that? I need to know what f of x plus h is. So what's f of x plus h? Yeah, so x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Is that cool? x plus h squared, expanded. So now let's look at our f prime, which is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. What can you do there? Guess not the x squared. Yeah, x squared is die. <laughs> and h cancels it from each of those, right? 2x plus h. So you get the limit as h goes to 0 of 2x plus h. <laughs> Let x go to 0 and you get 2x. So that means the slope at any point, get out of there, is twice that. It's interesting. So what's the slope at negative 1? Negative 2. Negative 2, exactly like we said. Slope at negative 3 would be negative 6. It gets bigger, more, it gets steeper the further back you go. At 0, at 0. It's, it's interesting. There's a nice pattern. Notice how this is x squared, and the 2 just came out front. There's a pattern we're going to play into later. x cubed is not 3x, so be careful. That's so we're simplifying it. So our life is going to be ruled by this process, this whole process here. And then we're going to leave it. We're going to start seeing patterns and just learning derivatives directly and not doing the limits. But it's going to be this for a while. An example. The minute I get this, that is a function that tells me the slope at any point. So, for example, at negative 1, the slope would be negative 2. That's funny. All right, guys. Don't forget, quiz on Wednesday.